So first of all, can the brain reorganize after brain damage? Um, the main domain where people have studied this, which we haven't talked about yet, but we will in a month, um, is the case of language. Okay, so it's just something, there are lots of studies of this. People have been onto this question for a long time. In fact, Broca wrote about this question 200 years ago. Okay, so the, the basic findings are that if you have damage to your language parts of your brain in adulthood, that is not good. Often you'll recover a little bit of function, but you won't get, you really won't get it back. It's just a big, massive drag. There are people we will talk about in a month when we get to the language um, um, section who have had massive left hemisphere strokes that basically take out their entire language system, okay? And it doesn't come back years after that stroke. We'll see actually that they're cognitively pretty normal in every other respect. It's quite amazing how much they can do without language, which is fascinating. But for present purposes, the main finding is um, brain damage in adulthood um, uh, that takes out language functions, not good, okay? Not much recovery, not much reorganization. By the way, there's a whole, it's very trendy in popular media to talk about, oh, the brain is plastic, you can rewire your brain, take this, you know, use a smartphone app and rewire your brain. Like mostly that stuff is just bullshit, <laughs> right? You can learn a task and you can get better at that task, no question, but you can't make yourself smarter. Right? You can't like rewire your whole brain. That's garbage. Okay. All right. Back to aphasia. <laughs> um, okay. The story is very different for brain damage in kids. If um, if you take if you have brain damage in the first few months of life, to language parts of the brain, as an adult, your language function is pretty good. It's not quite perfect. It took people a while to discover that it isn't quite perfect but it's surprisingly good. For everyday uses, you might not even notice. I mean, you have to test people on esoteric syntactic things to discover that actually it's not quite right, but it's very good. And typically what you see if you scan these kids is that a lot of language function has reorganized and shifted over to homologous regions in the right hemisphere, okay? Um, okay, so that's better news. After age five, if you have brain damage, not so good. Okay, so it's like there's some critical period for when the brain is plastic. You can move language over to the right hemisphere up until around age five, and after that, you can't really. Okay. All right, so these consider, so, right, that's what I just said. So these considerations have been um, pulled together under something called the Canard Principle. And the Canard Principle basically says, if you're gonna have brain damage, have it early. Better not to have the brain damage, but if you have to have it, have it early. Okay, and that's based on findings like this. The fact that the kids who have left hemisphere damage have much better language function as adults than adults who have left hem the same kind of left hemisphere damage. Okay, so that's a reasonable summary of the language literature. However, this finding doesn't always hold, okay? Um, and uh, it has led others to put forth the HEB principle, which is sort of the opposite. <laughs> the idea of the HEB principle is that, first of all, it depends. It depends on where the damage is. It depends on when you test after brain damage, okay? But the key kind of insight that will make this seem more sensible, if at first you feel like it's very intuitive, kids are more plastic in all kinds of ways, right? I mean, watch me using a computer that drives my students insane. I'm so slow. One of my students, once I was Back when I used to actually scan subjects, one of my students was watching me scan, and he's just getting more and more impatient. And he finally is like, it's like watching my mother. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's just like you, you cannot become as fluent as things, at things when you start doing it when you're 50, right? It's just what it is. We've all seen that manifest in various ways. Okay, so that's generally true, and that's consistent with this canard principle, is that you have more flexibility uh, when you're younger than older which is also why you guys should learn lots of math and computer science now while your brains are still good at it. Don't wait until you're 40 when it's harder. You will need it. No matter what field you are in, you will need it. So do all of that now. Okay, but to get back to the topic at hand, what, was, um, what, was the, what is the idea behind the head principle? The idea is, um, think about building a house. You can't build the first floor if you haven't built the foundation. Similarly, you might imagine that there are lots of 
aspects of cognition that are necessary precursors for other aspects of cognition. And if you're wiring up a whole brain, you're not going to develop those second order ones if you don't get the first order ones. And so if you have damage early in, um, early in life, you may have bigger long-term consequences. Really concrete, kind of silly example. Suppose you have damage to primary auditory cortex at birth and you're deaf. Well, you're gonna have a harder time learning language because you need to hear to get language, right? Well, I mean, if you have smart parents, they'll teach you sign language, you'll be okay. But you know, this is a necessary prior condition, right? And so more generally, it turns out that in a lot of domains, um, some aspects of brain and cognition are necessary precursors for others. And in those cases, the Canard pr principle doesn't hold. Okay. Okay. Um, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now let's get kind of, this is all sort of in principle vague stuff. Okay. What about visual cortex? Uh, what about all this stuff we've been talking about here? All of these specialized regions for different features and different categories. And you may notice I've now added visually presented words on there. Remember, visually presented, not auditorily, right? Auditory is a whole different thing. This is seeing words and letters. Okay, so all of this organization, um, can this stuff move around? If you lose this thing, can you regrow it over there? Okay, well, not really, right? As I've been talking about, if you have brain damage in adulthood, you basically lose the corresponding mental function. That's why we have all these neuropsychological syndromes. If people could relearn and just move the function over, you wouldn't have a syndrome. You might have a transient problem as you relearned. But in fact, if people get achromatopsia, can't see color vision, they're not gonna get better, or not much. Agnosia, if they can't see shape, they're not gonna get better. Akinetopsia, they can't see motion after a stroke in adulthood, they're not gonna get better. Prosopagnosia, topographic disorientation, and alexia, inability to read due to a stroke. Basically, people don't really recover from these things. There's a beautiful recent article by um, a German um, uh, neuroscientist who had a stroke and couldn't read uh, at, I don't know, age 50, 60, something like that. And so made himself an experimental subject and was just determined to relearn to read. And he did every possible thing. And he's written about this very interestingly. And there's a, an article I can put on the website if anybody wants to read it. Um, he, he basically retaught himself to read, but he's doing it in completely different ways from what all of you are doing. He doesn't have that bit. He didn't develop a new one of those. He developed a very different compensatory strategy that's very slow and doesn't work anywhere near as well as reading does for any of us, okay? So basically in adulthood, these things can't move around. So now are we talking canard or are we talking heb, right? So um, what, happens, um, what happens if you get the um, damage in childhood? Well, I'm raising this question because I think it's big and deep and interesting, but there basically isn't much of an answer to it. Um, it's hard to answer. I'll give you just a shred of data, but basically I think we don't know the answer and I'm, I'm dying to know the answer. Um, I'll give you just one, the one paper that's, that I know of that's relevant to this. This is a study from quite a while ago. Uh, it's the case of a patient who's known in the literature as Adam. And Adam sustained bilateral damage to his ventral visual pathway, both sides, at day one of age, okay, due to a stroke. Actually, strokes around birth are, are surprisingly common, like this happens, okay? So this guy basically lost cortex in a lot of the regions that we've been talking about on the bottom of the brain that do high level vision. Okay, so he was tested for this study at age 16. Now his visual acuity, his ability to see fine grained stuff is not great and his object recognition is not perfect, but it's not terrible either. He can recognize common objects from photographs uh, and line drawings reasonably well. Okay, so he has some residual vision, but he can't recognize faces at all. So he is a fan of this TV series called Baywatch, which I don't know about. I don't know if that's like, anyway, this study was done a long time ago. Anyway, some, some beach TV series that has the same set of characters. And he was obsessed with this and he watched it for an hour every day for a year and a half. And that's just relevant because it, we know that he has lots of experience uh, or looking at these individuals, um, but when tested in the lab on pictures from Baywatch, he couldn't recognize any of the major protagonists. 
That's just a measure of how severely prosopagnosic he was. Okay. So that suggests that when the relevant parts of the brain, uh, that the relevant parts are already specified at birth, and if you lose those parts, you can't just put that function somewhere else. Okay. So that suggests, I mean, it's, I'm not leaning too hard on this because there's just very little data. This is the, the best there is. Um, um, so it suggests that those, that at least the general region is already specified. Can anybody think about why that might be? Why can't you just kind of train up some other part of cortex? Say, you know, as object recognition is pretty good, why can't you train up part of the object recognition system and just say, okay, learn to do faces? Nobody knows the answer to this. Yes? I don't know, but the reason <coughs> it's gone completely might like, just be because, like, throughout time, like, very far back in evolution, we did the face um, region. Like, yeah, yes, but still, yeah, I mean, it's, it's clear that we, you know, we have it and we probably have it for some reason and all of that. Um, but why couldn't you just grow a new one over in a different part of cortex? What's wrong with that other bit of cortex? What might it not have that you might need? Shokoha. The right connection? Yes! I just showed you guys that they're very distinctive connections. This is all speculation. Nobody knows why. I'm just saying that one guess is that the reason these things can't just take up residence someplace else is they need those particular connections. Right, to get the right input to process, right? Okay, anyway, this is going way beyond the data. Um, but in principle, people could get more data of this kind and answer this question. If I can find the relevant subjects, I'm aiming to do this. <laughs>